Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about like the actual paleontological data that we could use to answer this question, like when were there the most species? And so I first want to talk about, um, I, I asked the question in terms of species, but for a lot of fossils, we don't always have like really well demarcated species. And sometimes it's, it's maybe more reliable to just say, okay, I'm pretty sure this is the right genus, but I'm not sure how many species there are within that genus. So a lot of paleontological uh, diversity patterns are uh, analyzed at the genus level or above, you know, genus or, or family, or some, in some cases even higher. So in, in, uh, in this case, we, we have um, some, uh, which one's the dark curve? Sapkowski's thin line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there was an attempt to figure out what's the overarching pattern of genus diversity in the fossil record. And what uh, Sepkoski and some, some others helped out, but it was mostly just this guy, Jack Sepkoski, who just spent years in a library looking up like different uh, species descriptions and genus descriptions that different paleontologists had given and trying to figure out what the first occurrence and the last occurrence was in the fossil record. And so if he had the first occurrence of something here and the last occurrence of something here, and then another genus had like its first occurrence here and here, uh, you know, yeah, what, which I actually don't know which way you're going to be viewing this. So it's, this is hard for me to do left and right. Um, but uh, this, this time period here would have kind of the overlap of those two. So there'd be two species, then there'd be one species over here and one species over here, right? So you, you look for first occurrence, last occurrence, and you assume that the genus is there the whole time, even if you don't have a lot of fossils of it here. Right, does that make sense? Um, and so using this strategy, he generated a curve, something like this. He, and it's, it's actually, his, his data are the, uh, the light, the smaller line. And so it starts in the, in the Cambrian 541 million years ago. And then it seems like there's a really dramatic uptick so that, you know, around 70 or 80 million years ago, there's more genera than there ever have been in the world before. And then there's a mass extinction when there's you know a big meteor hit, like hits, you know, asteroid hits the earth or whatever. And then fairly quickly, the, the, um, the genus diversity levels go back up to their previous uh, you know, high point. And then they just dramatically exceed it. They go way up <laughs> towards the neogene. So starting yeah, starting, so this, this boundary is like 25 or 30 million years ago. So, so starting around like 40 million years ago, maybe, there's more genera than there have ever been before in the world. And so the, these data are marine invertebrates. I don't think this one includes fishes. Marine metazoan genera crossing boundaries and exclude tetrapods. So it does include fish. So it includes fishes like in the traditional sense. It includes like placoderms and sharks, um, but it does not include tetrapods. Unlike one of the questions on your recent exam. Um, so, so here, and importantly, based on what you know about what's going on, this, this is all marine data. And up until around the Silurian or the Devonian, you know, even into the Devonian, there wasn't much going on on land. So the, the vast majority of diversity was in the ocean for the first, you know, 150 million years or so of Earth's history. And then at some point, there was a crossover because now the vast majority of on land, of, of on land, the vast majority of uh, species diversity is on land. And it's, a lot of it is insects and flowering plants. It's like insects and then like flowering plants and then, you know, the, there's a lot of spiders and stuff too, but terrestrial diversity today really dwarfs marine diversity. So that's also going to be an important thing to kind of put in the back of your mind. But let's just look at like broad trends in diversity and assume that maybe if there's like dips or, you know, upticks in diversity in the marine realm, maybe, maybe that's roughly correlated with what's happening on land potentially. But the, so the cool thing about these data is, is that they, they almost show like an equilibrium, right? There's kind of like some ups and downs, like, but you can imagine 
this is the number of genera, but you can imagine something like a carrying capacity, right? Where like there's a really rapid population growth and then you kind of hit this ceiling where it's like, oh, okay, I guess there's not any more room for more individuals with the, with, you know, in, in terms of carrying capacity, that's how population biologists kind of think about it. Not really, but kind of, um, with genera, it seems like there's kind of like peaks in genera diversity and then they, they go back down, but, um, it, it never really, uh, rises above the threshold of the ceiling until, you know, sometime around the Mesozoic Marine Revolution where, where there's starting to be more and more genera. And then for some reason, there's this dramatic uptick in the end. So, you know, we don't totally know why this could have happened because, you know, the there's a mass extinction between the Triassic and the Jurassic. There's not really a mass extinction between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. There's just like more different stuff. Um, and then there's a mass extinction here, but there's like a hundred you know, there's, there's a really around, yeah, 150 million years or 160 million years here where there's not really a mass extinction. And, and so organisms have a chance to diversify, but then it seems like for some reason they go back, they get shot back down and then marine invertebrate diversity just goes way up. So this has nothing to do with, well, you know, nothing directly, directly to do with angiosperms at this point, as far as we know, there's, there's some cool potential indirect impacts that angiosperms could have had at this point. But um, so far as we know, no direct impact that angiosperms could have had. But the important thing about these data are that they're, they're based on first and last occurrences. And so if the fossil record is dramatically better here, then we're more likely to get uh, more and more occurrences of, of organisms. So if, as the fossil record gets better, we're more and more likely to have last occurrence data that are, are, that are also sampled, just because there's so many more rocks that are marine sediments in, uh, you know, in the Paleogene and the Neogene than there are in like the Jurassic or the, Crita or the Triassic, or, and certainly more than, than there are at any other time period back here. So, so part, of, part of this dramatic uptick could be a sampling artifact. It could just be that there's just more sampling from here. The fact that you're doing range through, you know, you're doing first and last occurrence means that if you have, you're more likely to find later and later last occurrences as you get more and more towards the recent. So, um, oops. So what Alroy et al did was they did a resampling strategy like uh, I sort of talked about in my little allegory of the three entomology students or the, the two entomology students and the one reluctant uh, entomology uh, workhorse. And what Alroy et al. did was they, they lumped just fossil occurrence data. So not first and last occurrence, but just, okay, were there any fossils found in this two million year time period? And they ignored you know, the potential that, okay, like there is actually a record of this genus here and there's a record of the genus here. Um, just ignored that and say, okay, but did you find it here? And if you did, then it counts. And so they made collections like that and then they figured out which time chunk sort of had the fewest uh, individual collections. So the fewest like literal fossils. And then they were like, okay, so we'll just resample um, maybe like a thousand or we'll resample 2000 or something like that. Uh, and we'll, we'll just draw fossils out of this hat until we get to a certain threshold number. And we'll do that again and again and again. And we'll reach, um, we'll generate sort of an estimate of how many species there are or how many genera there are per like, uh, per 2000 fossils or something like that, right? Does that make sense? And so that's how they're generating these confidence intervals here is that they sampled these different time intervals a bunch of times and they got diversity estimates from here to here maybe. And then this was the median or something like that. So yeah, so 16,200 specimens had been recovered from each bin. So it, it was actually, it was, it was more. So in, in my other YouTube video, I, I said, you know, I'm just going to draw 20 insects from each of the different students. 
in this case, they're drawing 16,200 specimens from, from each fossil, from each time period, from each sort of collection, collection period. And uh, in, it, it's sort of analogous to the, the way I was describing uh, devising a sampling strategy that would kind of allow you to compare, you know, sort of apples to apples, even though the collecting intensity was really different in the, in the different student collections. So when they did that, when they corrected for, for sort of sampling effort or for rocks available, uh, they found that there really wasn't statistically more genera in the Neogene, you know, in the past 20,000 years than there were 100,000 years ago. And maybe even not that many, you know, it's kind of overlapping uh, overlapping confidence intervals with uh, some of the other uh, Cretaceous samples and even some uh, Paleozo or some Permian and some Devonian samples. So this is this is a really it's a really interesting finding because it implies that what we thought was um, kind of like an exponential increase in diversity towards the present is actually just a sampling artifact. It's just because there's just literally more fossils. And there really might not actually be that many more specimens, uh, at, or there might not be that many more genera now than there were 100 million years ago. And so this is just marine animals that aren't tetrapods. It doesn't really say anything about what's happening with insects and angiosperms. So in, in the case of those two things, there probably really has been an increase in terrestrial diversity uh, over the past 100 million years or so, because angiosperms became more and more a part of uh, terrestrial environments throughout the Cretaceous. So uh, unfortunately, we still don't have quite enough like plant fossil data or insect fossil data to really make this a viable sampling strategy. Like this sampling strategy works because in every time bin, there's way more, or in most, in a lot of time bins, there's way more than 16,200 specimens. There's a ton of specimens. We really have a lot of fossils. You know, the fossil record is often, you know, people complain about how incomplete the fossil record is and like, sure, yeah, it's incomplete, but there's a bunch of fossils. And you can actually view a lot of them at the paleo, Biology database or the PBDB, PaleoDB, the Paleobiology database, and you can just go in and you can be like, I want to explore how many fossils there are, and all these little dots are fossils, and you can say, okay, I just I just want to check out the Mesozoic. Let's just look at the Mesozoic, and so that'll rearrange which dots you're seeing. And I've made the screen a little bit too small. Maybe I'll just resize the, the browser here. Yeah. Uh, so you can say, okay, I just want to look at, mm, whoops. I just want to look at mollusks from the Mesozoic. Mesozoic mollusks. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of them. And then you can actually say, okay, figure, generate a diversity curve. And what this does is it generates a diversity curve of mollusks for the um, for the Mesozoic, and you can say, oh, okay, how many how many families are there at different time periods? And it's a lot smaller, but it's actually it seems like maybe there's kind of an equilibrium potentially. Like it doesn't seem like it gets way higher towards the end than at the beginning. Like if you drew, you know, if you tried to draw like a linear regression through these data, you might not get that much of a slope. Uh, and you can change how many, yeah, you can change how many time bins they're looking at as well. And then you can also uh, use advanced generator, the advanced diversity generator. This might take a long time, but this allows you, this automatically allows you to do something kind of similar to what Alroy was doing, Alroy et al. were doing, was using sampled in bin diversity. And so based on those data, you actually don't get um, you don't get as much of an increase and you, you kind of dampen out some of these oscillations a little bit. So what if you want to say, okay, well, what about 
Yeah, can we do the Phantomazoic? Yeah, so with the fan with the Phantomazoic, it does seem like there's more family diversity uh, in the Cenozoic than in the Mesozoic. You know, it seems like there might be kind of an equilibrium here, maybe. It seems like it goes up and down, but there might be kind of an equilibrium, and then a higher equilibrium in the Mesozoic, maybe, or kind of an increase as, as you go through the Cretaceous. Um, Cretaceous. Oh, yeah. Look at all these Cretaceous things, though. That's pretty cool. That's kind of cool. And then use advanced diversity curve generator. And you could see, like, sampled in-bin diversity for this. Sometimes this takes a long time because I'm asking it to do something kind of annoying. But the cool thing, in just in general, I'm just going to let it think about that. The really cool thing is that it, there's a lot of fossil data. You know, there's really... Uh, yeah, it says... <laughs> Oops. No, it's not... Come on. Dang it. All right. Ah. All right. Well, it says it says there's a lot of fossil data. You'll just have to take my word for it. Now it's now it's messing up. It doesn't like what I've done. Come on. Whoops. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So there's there's something like yeah, two hundred thousand total collections, or one. There's more than one million occurrences. So there's a lot of so some collections include multiple specimens, for example, maybe. So there are a lot of data. It's actually a little bit hard to analyze it perfectly just within this web database, but you can go through and say like, oh, okay, how did, yeah, let's let's look at the Phanerozoic diversity patterns of mammals. And so for this, this all the little dots show you where all the little mammals are found. And if you generate a diversity curve for mammals, you can say, oh, okay, yeah, like for sure, you know, there's some mammals in the Jurassic, you know, starting maybe in the mid-Jurassic, and then there's, you know, kind of the same amount in the Cretaceous, and then there's a pretty dramatic increase in the number of mammal specimens uh, as you head into the Cenozoic. And I have a feeling that if you uh, use the advanced diversity curve generator, you'll see that that's a real increase. Yeah, so that's, so if you, if you do the sampled families. Uh, some of this is noise. Some of these dips are just because there aren't any fossils and it's kind of overfitting the curve a little bit. But there's definitely more mammal families in the Cenozoic than there are in the Cretaceous. That's, that's a really dramatic difference. And a variety of different people have looked at, uh, where's my folder? So Roger Close and colleagues have done a bunch of papers where they're looking at terrestrial tetrapods. And so that's that's really kind of the take home artifact or artifact. That's the take home lesson in some of the other papers that I put in the Google Drive folder is that uh, you know similarly to the uh, Alroy et al papers where they showed that the marine animals that aren't tetrapods uh, didn't really have that much of an exponential increase in the Cenozoic. Um, the uh, the terrestrial tetrapods that Roger Close et al are looking at. They also kind of correct for this um, this sampling uh, intensity bias, and they find that they can make some of those increases in diversity disappear. In part because just yeah, the terrestrial area, uh, yeah, there's there's just more fossil area in the in the Cenozoic. They, they're also doing some really sophisticated things with trying to figure out how many, um, how far apart the fossils are from each other. Because you can imagine that if you have fossils from like really far apart from each other, then you might find different species in each area, right? But if the fossils, if their paleo locations were really close to each other, then you might be more likely to just kind of be resampling the same sort of general community. So this, this paper is actually really sophisticated. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, all the stuff that they did. But what, what they're looking for is, is different, uh, different ways of kind of correcting for uh, sampling error, essentially, or sampling intensity, I should say.
yeah, so I actually, I, <laughs> I tried to load up some, some different, uh, some different diversity curves, but it actually doesn't show what taxa that I've selected and I've already forgotten which ones they are. So yeah, it, but it's, it's fun to kind of play around this on your own. You can, you can do this. It just, it just takes a minute to load some of these, um, less automatic diversity generators. So you'll have to, you'll have to kind of take my word for it. But yeah, if you want to look at Paleozoic, oh, Paleozoic brachiopods. I wonder what that will show. Or no, let's do Mesozoic brachiopods. Yeah, Mesozoic brachiopods go down. Mesozoic brachiopods go down, y'all. That's real. I'm pretty sure that's real. There really are fewer brachiopods in the Cretaceous than there were in the Triassic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's that's part of your that's part of your diversity homework, or that was that was part of the uh, the deep time worksheet. Um, I think maybe I'm gonna call it here. Oh no, I do want to talk about other ways you could kind of address this question because the terrestrial stuff we don't have as good of a fossil record for. We know that at some point terrestrial diversity became higher than marine diversity. And so, you know, how many species there are really to a first order approximation is just how many species of terrestrial arthropods there are right now. You know, it's pretty much, it's not how many species of mammals there are. It's, you know, if someone's asking you how many species there are in the globe, uh, in terms of described species, it's pretty much how many species of insects there are plus like a rounding error. You know what I mean? There, there are probably genuinely a lot of nematode species too, but in, in some cases there might actually be, uh, the number of nematode species probably does also sort of track insect diversity as well, because there are some species specific nematode parasites and stuff. Um, and there are also nematodes that specialize on certain types of plants. So, so land plants and insect diversity probably tracks um, what, uh, what the overall global diversity pattern is doing. So you might be aware that in general, there are, oh no, I closed the thing. Oh well. You might be aware that in general, there's a latitudinal diversity gradient. And so one way of saying uh, how many species there are is, you know, how, how much land area is close to the equator. Another thing that you might be aware of is that there's not a ton of, species diversity in ice. There are some really cool organisms that are adapted to living in freezing conditions, but in general, if you put a bunch of glaciers on top of stuff, you're gonna lower the diversity a little bit. And so something to keep in mind is that as the, as the um, sort of diversity, um, the relative diversities in marine and terrestrial environments switches as you move you know, towards the Cretaceous uh, you kind of, you might want to look at how, um, how much unglaciated land area there is and how the continents are kind of broken up. So one of the things you can do is check out, uh, this Scotese, I forget his, Scotese.com, Christopher Scotese, that's his, that's his name. So this, this dude actually spoke at SU um, back in February, I think, like right before, eh, not right before the pandemic, but uh, yeah, bef yeah, I think late February maybe. And he's the one who's done, who's literally done a lot of these old, uh, these, these uh, plate tectonic reconstructions of like what the earth probably looked like at different periods of time. And there's kind of an, it's kind of an open question as to what the fragmentation of continents might do to diversity. Is there gonna be more species diversity if the continents are more broken apart because there's more different islands? I, I tend to think that actually, yeah, like at a, at a certain level, um, there probably are, if you break up the world, if you broke up the world so that it was only Madagascar sized chunks, that would be pretty close to like the maximal terrestrial diversity you could have. Cause, cause when an island is the size of Madagascar, it's big enough to support 
a lot of like relatively large animals. Um, but you also, if you had isolated Madagascars, that just like their total area equaled the current land area of Earth, I think that would be pretty much the maximal global diversity, because you'd have a lot of species. Oh, you'd have a lot of species turnover from Madagascar to Madagascar to Madagascar. There'd be like different species on every little Madagascar, right? So I think that would be how you'd maximize terrestrial diversity. Anyway, you'd also have a lot of continental margin area, right? And so continental margins are where marine diversity tends to be the highest. So that that seems like it would be cool on on both counts. So so one way you could you could think about this question is uh, like what what was the configuration of continents at different points in time? And so in in the Jurassic, in the late Jurassic there was this major southern uh, supercontinent called Gondwana, where like South America, I don't know if you can see this, South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia were all together. India and Madagascar were all together. So all these continents were all mashed together. But then as you head into the Cretaceous, and I think this is, yeah, this is close to 100 million years ago, things have really started to fragment a lot. So South America and Africa have broken apart. North America is actually split in half. There's the shallow inland sea right here. Uh, India has started to migrate off of Gondwana as well. Australia and Antarctica are probably still, maybe still connected at that point. And South America and Antarctica are almost connected, but probably not quite. And then in the Eocene, which is like 50 million years ago, it's really one of the times when the Earth was maximally fragmented. So Antarctica is still by itself, and it hadn't started to glaciate. So there was this whole Australia-sized continent here, all by itself, covered in forest. And it hadn't really started to be covered in, gla like covered in glaciers yet. So I think that's really interesting. And then potentially some of Europe was uh, isolated from Asia. Africa was still separate from Eurasia. India hadn't clumped into the Himalaya yet, or it, it was about to, um, you know, 45 million years ago, it might actually be about ready to clump into there. Madagascar was uh, closer to its current position, but it had been by itself for a really long time. Australia and Antarctica had kind of split apart. So I think if I really had to put my money on when there were the most species on Earth, I actually think it would be 45 million years ago. Of the choices that I gave you, I think it would actually be here because you have no completely glaciated continents. And from what we can tell based on the paleontological data uh, from you know mass extinctions and everything, diversity levels recover from mass extinctions really quickly within, within uh, two to five million years, basically. So, so after the KT extinction or the KPG extinction where, the, where most of the non-avian dinosaurs were uh, wiped out by that uh, asteroid, uh, that was 65 million years ago ish. So by 45 million years ago, there had been more than enough time for diversity to rebound. Forests were increasingly dominated by angiosperms. Insect diversity was probably really high uh, locally, but also globally because they had like a whole other Australia sized continent, Antarctica, to live on. Right now, if you go to Antarctica, like I love penguins, they're great, but it's not very biodiverse. Before it was glaciated, it probably had a lot of species and a lot of them were probably unique to that continent. So that's where my money is on. But, um, but I, I liked looking at a lot of your thinking for these. So it was, it was fun to read a lot of these. And I realized that, um, you know, I, I didn't give you the answer beforehand because I wanted you to think about it. So I'm not penalizing you for disagreeing with me, but just, for the record, that's that's my money is uh, is forty five million years ago.